Welcome to Inside Science Conversations. I'm your host, Chris Gorski. I'm the senior editor at InsideScience.org, a science news website published by the American Institute of Physics. This is a show about what makes scientists tick, what inspires them, and what they want to do. Today, we're talking to Kristen Nicholson. She's an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery and the director of the pitching lab at Wake Forest University. Kristen, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk about all the work that you've done in, with baseball, and maybe we can even touch on some of the other things you've done. But first, I wanted to find out when you were a kid, elementary school, going into middle school, what did you think you might do as a career, if you even thought about that? Yeah, I, I don't know that I was ever set on anything. I guess I thought I was going to do something with animals, maybe a zoologist, something along those lines. I even formed a little club with some of my friends. We called it the Animal Career Club. Um, and we would we'd meet in their backyard and I don't know, discuss different careers and animals, I guess. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, ironically, I don't think any of us have careers in animals, but uh, that was what we found interesting as elementary school kids. <laughs> <laughs> That's really neat. <laughs> um, and so when did science become something specifically that you wanted to pursue? Yeah, I think I've always been interested in, you know, science and math and physics. Um, and in high school, you know, I liked the the science fields. And then I also liked um, just being outside and in the environment. So uh, as a freshman, I actually was an environmental science major. And then I uh, went through that first semester of college and realized that I was never going to have to take a math class. And I was like, I kind of missed that. And I was like, I was disappointed that I wasn't going to get to take math. And so then I was like, well, maybe I should be a math major. And so I switched my um, major and ended up being a uh, math with, you know, applied math as, as my focus. Um, and my undergrad degree is in pure math. Okay. So that's interesting to hear. So you did math and then how did you decide what was next? So I did math and um, it was fun and I'm glad that I got to take some math classes, but I didn't necessarily love, you know, sitting down and solving math problems. I didn't really see kind of the benefit and the applicability of that. So I was applied math. And so I was just kind of looking for, you know, a more hands-on something you could do with math. And I had um, an internship at NASA actually, and I was writing a computer program that I think was too math heavy for the computer science people. Um, and, and that was kind of the, the trajectory that my career looked like it was going. And again, I didn't love just sitting by myself on the computer, you know, writing computer programs, solving math problems. And so at the time, I personally um, have always been also athletic and active. And like I said, like being outside, I ran cross country and track in high school and my freshman year of college. And then I switched to doing triathlons. And so I was looking for something that maybe I could combine my love for sports and athleticism and uh, math. And so I stumbled upon biomechanics, which is essentially physics of the human body. And so I had an REU a research experience for undergraduates at the Cleveland Clinic um, in biomechanics. And I was looking at finding optimal walking gait that would minimize energy expenditure or minimize fatigue. Um, and, you know, I just kind of fell in love with the idea of, of biomechanics and able to combine kind of that math and athleticism and physics and science um, and decided to pursue a um, master's and PhD in biomechanics. So that's kind of the trajectory I went, maybe not the most traditional, but. <laughs> Man, that's really interesting, though. So you're you're when when you're studying the walking gait, what's the kind of purpose of that? Is that with people who are having trouble walking and trying to figure out how to minimize the energy they need, or is it something else? So, as an undergrad in my first 
kind of like experience into biomechanics. It was just general biomechanics. So I was using um, you know, MATLAB and, and some optimization programs and just equations of physics um, and equations of motion to, to optimize this mathematical calculation of gait and walking. But in grad school, I found myself getting more and more involved in this motion analysis and the motion capture, um, which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. But the main goal of kind of motion capture and biomechanics or the um, original uses was for gait and for helping kids, mostly kids, um, with like cerebral palsy or muscular dystrophy that have some functional movement disorder. And so you can use the biomechanics and the, the optimizations and all the calculations to help inform you know, orthotics or surgery recommendations. Um, I know in the, your last episode, you talked a lot about running economy. So you can even use the, the biomechanics and the equations to optimize your running patterns to use less energy or um, you know, induce less fatigue so that you can be a more efficient runner, um, faster times, use less energy, things like that. So how did you decide on what to do when you were in grad school, what kind of problems to, to investigate? I came into grad school thinking I wanted to do, you know, that combo of math and athletics and, and performance analysis. Um, I was a triathlete myself, so I was kind of thinking more along the lines of the running analysis and how to optimize that kind of stuff. And my advisor told me that we could do the sports and we could do the athletics for fun, but that all of the funding and the money and everything was going to be in the more clinical side of biomechanics or motion analysis. And so I, I took his advice and um, ironically, all of my grad school was paid for by a project that we did with US figure skating. So you know, there is some money in, in, the, in the sports, um, but I did focus on a more clinical project uh, for my um, dissertation. And so my advisor uh, had a really close working relationship with some of the orthopedic surgeons at the Shriners Hospital in Philadelphia. And they dealt a lot with children with brachial plexus birth injuries. And um, what they found was that it was really difficult to measure what the shoulder blade is doing um, because traditional motion capture and motion analysis works by you put retro reflective markers on different um, body parts, and then the cameras just record the positions of the markers. And so then using math and physics, you're able to create coordinate systems for your different body segments, and then find the angles and velocities um, of the different joint angles uh, by using the, the 3D motion analysis. That doesn't work for the, the scapula or the shoulder blade, because if you put markers on your shoulder blade and then you move your arm, the shoulder blade moves underneath the skin. And so the markers don't actually follow the motion of the shoulder blade. And so our lab was really focused on trying to solve this problem, figuring out new and innovative ways that you could use the traditional motion capture to measure scapula function and, and orientation. And specifically in these kids with brachial plexus injuries, their um, shoulder joint, so that where the scapula meets the upper arm or the humerus, is, is fused. And so they use their scapula to compensate and gain that motion. So like if I ask you to bring your hand to your mouth, you know, you're gonna kind of go like this, do it or whatever, um, but they don't have this motion of the humerus against the scapula. And so they're, they use their whole shoulder, their whole scapula will wing out in order to get their arm kind of across their body and their hand to their mouth. I used um, mathematical modeling, so linear regression and also some machine learning type modeling. So where I took uh, the, the shoulder blades orientation in several different like static postures and then used mathematical modeling to um, model what it would be doing functionally based on where your upper arm and that one spot on the shoulder blade are. And it works well for healthy adults and it works okay for the kids with the brachial plexus injuries as well. And then one of my um, colleagues is actually continuing that and trying to apply it to baseball. And so it's, it's ongoing, um, but it's promising. So. 
I'm, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated whatever tie in there might be between the things you learned there and what you brought to figure skating, but more, more kind of to the, to the point, is that how you got the expertise that made it possible for you to work with baseball players? So I would say I'm an expert in kind of motion analysis, not necessarily like some aspects of biomechanics contain, you know, like, uh, like bone strength and, and muscle strength and, and more like granular mechanic type stuff. But I would say I'm more of a motion analysis expert. And uh, as I mentioned before, the traditional uses of motion analysis are for like gait pathologies and, and walking and using it on functional movement disorders for the lower extremity. And there aren't a lot of people out there who use motion analysis for the upper extremity. And there's a couple different reasons for that. Um, one being this really difficult problem of, of what is the scapula, what is the shoulder blade doing? You can't measure that in the traditional ways. Um, the other being that the shoulder is a lot more mobile than say your hips or your knees. I um, mean, your knees, especially, they only really move in one uh, plane, you know, flexion and extension. Your hip does does all three motions, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, internal external rotation, but primarily just kind of flexion extension when you're walking, but your shoulder can circumduct and you can get to the same end location multiple different ways. And these all pose uh, problems when you're trying to describe, you know, what the arm is doing mathematically. And so a lot of people just kind of avoid the upper extremity and, and do their work on the lower extremity. Um, and so by trying to tackle this problem of, of scapula orientation, you know, in whether it's healthy adults or, or kids with brachial plexus injuries, I kind of became an upper extremity biomechanics expert. Um, and so that allowed me to kind of transition into this, this baseball um, position just because there aren't very many upper extremity biomechanists out there. Wow. So was that kind of, did that feel like a natural progression to you or did you, was it some kind of like leap of faith? I can, I can do really well with this. Had you done baseball work before you got to Wake Forest? I had not done baseball work. So my um, advisor had always been interested in, in baseball. And I think when he first got into biomechanics, you know, baseball was kind of a passion for him. Um, and then he discovered that you, know, you couldn't really measure what the shoulder blade was doing. And that was a big problem. And so then he started venturing to tackling that problem. And that led him, you know, to this patient population at the Children's Hospital, and you know, like we said, a lot of the money and funding you're going to find in these more clinical. And so he kind of built his career more around shoulder and upper extremity, but these clinical sides of it, um, while pushing his kind of love for baseball uh, back. So you know, we his students always knew that he loved baseball, and that was like his first passion and and uh, reason for kind of getting into to biomechanics, but we never did any baseball research, um, you know, as his students. I did do the, the figure skating, as I said, and for the figure skating project, we actually were just looking at their in-air uh, motions. And so we had a program that would model what they actually did using the motion capture. And then you had a little figure that you could adjust their in-air position and rerun the simulation. So this is what would have happened had you gotten into this other position. And so we were able to um, tell them what they needed to do and what different positions they needed to get in in order to complete the jumps that they were trying to land. And most of the time it was just like, pull your arms in tighter, you'll spin faster. Um, but being able to visualize it, I think was a, a really powerful tool for them. Um, and then, so then leaving grad school, I actually went and worked in one of those more traditional pediatric gait labs where we did a lot of work with the kids with cerebral palsy and muscular dystrophy and uh, skeletal dysplasia and things like that. And um, I was always looking for an opportunity actually just to change locations. So I went to grad school in Delaware and I was working at the Children's Hospital in Delaware, um, but I'm from South Carolina. And so I was looking for an opportunity to, to come back home. And so this baseball opportunity you know, presented itself and I actually work for the hospital. I work for um, Wake Forest 
Baptist Health or uh, Atrium Wake Forest Baptist Health. And um, I have like a dual appointment as the baseball team's biomechanist. And so the hiring was done by the hospital. So I think that they really liked that I did have this clinical experience of working in this traditional you know, gate lab, but I also had the sports experience from the figure skating. And then I was an upper extremity specialist. Um, and so I think it was a leap of faith for the baseball team. You know, the uh, head coach recently said, you know, he was looking at my resume and it said figure skating and, you know, scapula mechanics and everything. And he was kind of like, I don't know, is this the right person? Um, but I think the, the hospital convinced them that, you know, kind of the technical math background combined with the motion capture expertise combined with being an upper extremity expert um, would allow me to to fill the role that they were looking for so well how is it working out yeah i mean it's it's definitely been uh interesting um i would have probably been the last person to say that this is where i would have been ended up three years ago but um you know i was kind of thrust into this as maybe an upper extremity my motion capture expert, but by no means a baseball expert. I mean, I, I like baseball. I would go to the minor league games with my family growing up as a, a kid, but definitely not, um, you know, a baseball expert by any means. And so it's been a, a big learning curve. I've surrounded myself with, with good people who are interested in the biomechanics, but really know kind of the coaching aspect of it. And they've kind of really helped tie in the you know baseball lingo and everything with with the biomechanics and um, I think we've built a really great team here and a lot of people are interested in what we're doing and um, yeah we're we're pushing forward and it's been exciting. That's neat. What kinds of things do you do you do with the baseball players? Yeah, so we have, um, you know, a full state of the art biomechanics laboratory, we have the motion capture cameras, we also have some markerless cameras, we have force plates in our mound, and then we have the traditional like ball tracking devices. And so we've really been um, offering pitching evaluations for anybody that wants to come and get a pitching evaluation. Uh, and we also use it as a player development tool for the Wake Forest baseball players. You know, they're able to get kind of the full analysis several times a year, and then they can use the marker list system almost weekly to see their progression. Um, and so, you know, up until this point, I feel like we've really kind of just been trying to build our, our database of, of pitchers that we have available to, to do the research and you know discover the problems and, and kind of solve the, the issues. I think to date we've seen about maybe 350 uh, pitchers all the way from 12 up to, to some professional um, level pitchers. And so that has enabled us to, to really start to explore some of these mysteries behind pitching and so i would like to say that you know just like with running there's this idea of like running economy or running efficiency where you can uh perform at a certain rate while minimizing kind of your energy expenditure so that you can keep going and, and and optimize your performance and so that's kind of what we're looking for with baseball too you know, we want to to limit the stresses on the arm you know that's the big thing the the tommy john surgeries those ucl reconstructions are becoming more and more uh popular and at younger and younger ages and so we look at that as the stress on the UCL or the elbow varus torque. And we wanna minimize that. And then shoulder issues are a big problem too, rotator cuff tears and, and injuries and impingement and things like that. So we kind of look at that shoulder distraction force, the force that's keeping the upper arm from essentially pulling out of the, the shoulder socket. Um, and we'd wanna try to minimize that. And so we're trying to look at all the different mechanics and pitching skills and everything that you can uh, alter and, and adjust to minimize those forces on the shoulder and the torques on the elbow. But at the same time, we don't want to limit their pitching velocity. You know, that's the, the goal, you know, that they're all chasing is, is a high pitching velocity. And so we have to figure out what we can do um, in terms of, of their biomechanics in order to 
you know, maintain or increase pitching velocity while decreasing those stresses on the elbow and on the shoulder. Yeah, I wanted to ask more about that because my understanding from talking to people over the years is that if you're throwing 95 or 100 miles an hour, you're basically maxing out everything the body has from the tendons to the muscles to everything else in, in, in search of that speed of the pitch, right? And so, you know, if, if somebody comes in and says, I'm not throwing as fast as I used to, can you help me understand why? Or if they're saying, I just really think I should be able to throw 97 instead of 95 miles an hour, you know, are you trying to help solve that problem specifically? Are you, are you looking at it holistically? What, you know, you know, I, I, I'm fascinated by this. Yeah. I mean, we kind of look at it holistically, like the, the holy grail here is this, you know, efficiency term that that is kind of elusive but you know can you limit the stresses on the shoulder and the elbow while still increasing pitching velocity um but you know my approach and and maybe this is coming from more the clinical side or clinical background is that if they're injured they can't pitch at all and so you know what's the point in you know getting somebody to throw 100 miles per hour if they're going to blow out their their elbow, you know, then, then it doesn't matter. So we got to keep them healthy in order to keep them on the field. Um, and then we can kind of focus on increasing their performance. Um, and they also, you know, this efficiency kind of goes hand in hand. If you're moving your body efficiently, and so that's limiting the stresses on, on the elbow and the shoulder, but it's still going to be able to produce those high velocities because you're efficient, you're creating energy, transferring it through the body efficiently, um, and then through to the ball. And there's not any hangups, not causing extra stress on the elbow and the shoulder. Um, and so you should be able to theoretically, you know, do both. You should be able to throw harder and increase your velocity while still staying healthy. And how do people, you know, obviously if, if a pitcher, a young pitcher, a college student, you know, a baseball player comes in and wants to wants to, you know, take, ha get evaluated, obviously they're interested, but is there a big variation in how receptive they are to the messages you might have? Y you know, are you able to take these medical insights, biomechanics insights, and kind of translate them to baseball lingo or, or, or something that a coach or a, or a player understands really well that they can grasp? Yeah, I mean, I think that that has definitely been a learning process for myself, especially having not been, you know, a baseball expert and, and understanding the baseball lingo. Um, but again, I've surrounded myself with, you know, some people who have taken an interest in the biomechanics, but also know that other lingo. Um, you know, the pitching coaches that we've had come through Wake Forest, um, Matt Hobbs, John Hendricks, and Corey Mascara, they've been great. And then we've also had some lab coordinators and they have um, a background in like pitching and being a pitching coach, but they're also invested in the biomechanics and being kind of that liaison or, or that link between what I say and then what the player can actually do to kind of implement those changes and move forward. And so, you know, Evan Wise and, and Mike McFerrin have really been beneficial, I think, in making the lab applicable and, and the information usable. I will say, you know, the people that come in and get a pitching evaluation, we then kind of just throw everything at them. They get the biomechanics feedback from me and they get some feedback from our athletic trainer and they get some feedback from our strength and conditioning coach and then the lab coordinator Mike McFerrin will sit down and, and go through it and then explain like what they can kind of do and I'm sure it's, it's overwhelming especially for the 12 year olds they probably mostly are just listening to the what can I do side of it um, but when it comes to the Wake Forest University pitchers we don't actually give them anything I give it to the pitching coach and then the pitching coach decides based on his knowledge of that player's you know personality and and learning type whether or not they need to see the raw data or whether or not they just need to know what drills to do um, and I think it does depend on the player you know some of them you want to know all the details and want to know if they're changing their you know, ground reaction force by a certain amount 
or they want to know, you know, if they're increasing their trunk rotational velocity. And then there's other ones that if you had told them specific numbers and specific things that they're trying to change would get too caught up in their head on every single pitch on whether or not they're doing that and then everything else would kind of get blown out way and, and it would not benefit them at all. And so you do need to kind of know the personality and, and there is this little bit of give and, and take on what how much information you actually give them. So there's so many kind of fine tuning questions that would go beyond efficiency of your of a particular pitcher's mechanics right from you know what i'm thinking about things like you know you know the the the, the things that people might be thinking about right off the bat would be things like can i throw the ball faster can i spin it faster or more times in its route to the plate but there's also all these areas about you know, fatigue and what happens at fatigue and what when somebody's tired after 75 or 100 or 19 pitches or however many, right? How, how you know, how that adds up over time, you know, both within a, a bout of pitching <laughs> within a game and then over a season or a career. Are there particular questions that you're looking at for research or, you know, people you work with are looking at and how do you prioritize these things? Yeah, there's definitely a lot of questions and a lot of things that you can look at. Um, one thing is, you know, prior to, to our lab, there was only a handful of other, other kind of labs like this. Um, there's ASMI down in Alabama with Glenn Fleissig. They've been around for a long time and they've offered these pitching evaluations, but they're associated with, with the hospital. So they've always just offered kind of pitching evaluations. And then um, driveline baseball has a little bit of the 3D biomechanics, but they're you know performance driven and, and for-profit company. And so they're more like, how can we use this to increase your velocity type stuff? They're not doing research projects. And then a lot of the questions that, that you've asked and that you've proposed have to do with you know, monitoring and, and something that, that you couldn't do if you just had somebody come in for a pitching evaluation and then they leave. And so as more and more kind of teams and facilities, I think, put in these labs, those are questions that we can actually start to understand and start to, uh, to look at. So our lab is attached to the Wake Forest baseball team complex. And so they can, and then um, with as the technology advances and you have more and more like markerless uh, motion capture systems, they can use it for every single bullpen that they throw. And so then you can start to get that information about fatigue. You know, is it make a difference from one day to the next? Uh, you know, is it, is it different, the bullpen after a game and um, things along that nature? Or, or even just, you know, I mentioned earlier, what we're looking at is that elbow valgus torque and that shoulder or elbow varus torque and that shoulder distraction force those are just assumptions. There's no good data that says, you know, this actually leads to injury. We just assume the more stress you put on your elbow, the likely, more likely you are to be injured. Um, but as we get more and more data and able to follow these players, you know, more closely uh, with repeat sessions, then we can actually start to answer the questions of, well, this is actually going to lead to an elbow injury, and this is actually going to lead to a shoulder injury. And these are things we need to fix, or these are things that are okay if you built them up appropriately, um, and questions like that. We did uh, try to collect data on all of our starting pitchers immediately coming out of a game to start to look at what their fatigued mechanics might look like. And we do have some of that data, um, but we were only able to do it for one season. And as um, most people are probably familiar, that a team only has, you know, four, five or six starting pitchers. Um, and so we only have five or six players worth of of that fatigue data. Um, but as you know, we're able to get more, I think we can start to look at that a little closer. There are some studies out there that have done like simulated games to try to look at how mechanics change with fatigue. Um, but is a simulated game really as good as a game? There's no like mental fatigue that you get with the game. Um, 
So yeah, those are all questions that we're excited to to start to look at. Um, as far as like what you prioritize, you know, I don't know. I, I just kind of have to go with, with what I have and what resources I have. And as the lab grows and we get more students and, and more data, that those are all questions that we want to tackle and, and look at. So you got a few things to figure out. Yes. Sounds like. <laughs> There's going to be work to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have there been any particular surprises or, or re especially rewarding things that you've been able to do in, a, in, in the last couple of years? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it's been a challenge. The lab opened in, in January of 2019, and then we had one probably solid year of of being able to use it however we wanted to. And, and then as we know, this pandemic hit and that kind of threw a wrench in, in everything that we wanted to do and, and how often we were able to use it. And um, uh, yeah, and then there's been a lot of turnover in the coaching staff and things like that. And so we've continued to kind of grow our, our database of pictures that we're able to pull data from and, and do things with. Um, but I we probably haven't been able to do everything that we that we wanted to do. We the in both in 2021 and 2020 we did have first round um, draft picks come out of wake forest so that was rewarding um you can look at their like very first motion analysis to their very last motion analysis and see that they were able to kind of make some of those changes that we recommended and so i would uh like to say that the lab played a part in in their success i mean they were very talented uh, individuals anyway, they, they may have been first run picks without the, the lab, but I'd like to say we had a hand in, in helping them out. Um, there has been less uh, injuries on, on the Wake Forest team um, compared to like the rest of the, the ACC or NCAA Division I programs. Um, so I'd like to say that we had kind of a part in that as well. And then yeah, I think kind of the most surprising thing is that that just the, over these last three years, I've somehow become the the baseball biomechanics expert, which I never would have um, expected. And MLB often comes to us and asks us to collaborate, and we've done some stuff with them. And a couple of the teams have um, agreements where they send their players to us to get evaluated. So it's been fun and, and exciting. Do you ever just sit back and think, how did how did I end up here? Definitely, all the time. And uh, my, I'm definitely like the the intro, introvert in the brain. And my um, husband actually is the one who says that he's kind of the mouse and and the energy. And uh, you know, he's having a great time uh, being a baseball family now and and getting to where we are. But yeah, I definitely, you know, every couple weeks or so, think about you know, how I got here and yeah, it still amazes me. Like I said, I don't know how I became the, the baseball biomechanics expert, but, but here we are. <laughs> Have there been any, is the, has the pandemic been the biggest challenge in building up this work and just, just continuing things or has there been something else that's been a, a, a big challenge through these last few years? No, I think the pandemic has probably been, been the biggest um, challenge and then just just trying to navigate kind of this dual appointment as what are my clinical you know um, expectations and then what are the kind of baseball biomechanics expectations, um, but it's been good and uh, I would everybody you know advocates for me and and I never kind of feel um, the pressure of like a lot of people would say well are was it difficult being you know a young woman in um, male dominated, both biomechanics and baseball, you know, they're both male dominated, but, um, you know, I've never really felt that pressure. The head of orthopedics, um, the head of sports medicine, the head baseball coach, they're all kind of my biggest advocates. And um, I've never really felt the fact that um, a young female were holding me back. So um, yeah, it's been, I've had a lot of support and it's been great. So what do you do from here you know are, what's what's kind of next with with this is it just continuing the work and, and and drilling down on questions or or some big jump to something else no i think i think it's just continuing on and and 
being able to to use it you know as this player development tool in addition to kind of the research uh you know for service pitching evaluation tool i think is the next step um with hopefully the the easing up of the pandemic you really can start to use it on a, a weekly basis and answer some of these more um pressing questions with more regular captures and i'm excited to see where it leads um you know we also have a lot of pre and well hopefully nobody gets hurt but if they do we'll have a lot of kind of like pre data that we can then maybe start using this as a return to sport tool and really assessing when they're ready to go back and hopefully preventing some of those re injuries by you know, knowing more granular information about whether or not they're ready to return to full um, playing. Lastly, I just want to ask what's been the is there a single moment that you can point to as the best thing that you've that 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 you've experienced as part of this in the last couple this of years? Podcast, right? No. Um... <laughs> Well, the yeah, the second best. Um, <laughs> I don't. I don't know that there's a singular thing. I, this year, especially, I've had a lot of invites to to talk at just more like renowned baseball things, like a World Pitching Congress and the winter meetings um, and things like that. So I think you know having that, having those invites kind of really boosts my confidence in it. Well, maybe I am the 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 biomechanics expert in pitching and, um, you know, and, and, and I'm good at, at what I do. There's a little bit of, you know, imposter syndrome, I think still, especially coming from not a baseball uh, background to into this whole baseball world. Well, I hear a lot of stories like that where people start down a road and somehow they just get better and better at the thing that they're kind of falling into. And a lot of people just, are both amazed and thrilled at how things are working out. Yeah, uh, yeah, I would definitely say, I mean, as we mentioned before, I just kind of sit back and, and look and I'm like, how did I, how did I get here? I never would have thought that this is where I was, would be, but, you know, MLB teams and scientists and people calling me up, you know, every week wanting to know what we're doing and, and how they can be involved. And uh, it, yeah, it's a good time. And that's always what you want, right? You want your your job and, and your career to be fun. So uh, I enjoy going in and collecting the data and looking at the numbers and helping the players be the best they can. Thanks, Kristen. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks to everybody for listening and watching Inside Science Conversations. Like and subscribe. Kristen referred to the episodes with Phil Skiba, who talked to us about training runners and triathletes, as well as being a doctor during the pandemic. We have other conversations with more researchers, and I hope you'll like those too.